Okay, every, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Kanat. I'm the planetary manager for the Newark Museum and uh, welcome to the Newark Museum's at home series of programs. And before we get started with our Ask an Astronomer program, uh, I just want to mention a few of our upcoming programs in this uh, series. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be having a story time at 3 p.m. featuring the book uh, Hattie and the Fox. Uh, on Thursday, we'll be posting an art making activity and also remember that our happy hour is happening early this week uh, due to the 4th of July holiday. Uh, happy hour is happening at 6 p.m. on Thursday instead of Friday. And I know that Anna and Daryl have a really nice uh, watermelon cocktail pop uh, recipe ready for you. And uh, you're going to need some ingredients to participate. So check out the website and make sure you have everything you need to participate in that. Sounds like fun. Uh, and uh, keep in mind that uh, with our online programs, we're also, also offering this summer our Camp Newark Museum online. And uh, registration is still open. Uh, the classes will start on July 6th. There's still have time to register for that. Uh, check us out on our website. You can register there. Uh, we also want to mention that we have a couple of community days coming up uh, at the Newark Museum uh, that you can participate online. Uh, on July 12th, we have Say It Loud, and that uh, is uh, uh, all about the Newark Uprising, uh, the anniversary and of the Newark Uprising, and we're going to be talking a little, comparing what happened back then to what's happening now. We also have a Pride Day, uh, so join us on Saturday, July 18th, uh, for our Pride celebration as well. Uh, but uh, So join us for some of those uh, programs, uh, please do uh, join us for those. But uh, let's get into our program. Let's uh, open our Ask an Astronomer program. Uh, today we have a guest speaker, Colin Hutchison. Uh, he's joining us live from the UK. And so uh, Colin is a council member for the British Association of Planetaria. And so he's going to be talking about human spaceflight, an exciting topic, uh, especially uh, this summer. And so uh, Colin, uh, if you could uh, take it away. And, uh, thanks, thanks, Kevin. So 30th of May, we all watched this, the launch of the SpaceX uh, rocket, Falcon rocket, taking two astronauts into space from US soil. The first time this has happened for about nine years. It's a big achievement, very exciting, but it's very much building on the experience and missions of the past 40 years, if not more, uh, to actually achieve it. So I want to take you back to the 12th of April, 1981. Uh, this was the launch of the very first space shuttle nine years after the last people had been on the, on the moon. Next slide. Thank you. So this was the launch of the shuttle. This was a if demo, demo shuttle, effectively the shakedown mission, a bit like the current mission. Uh, it was crewed by Bob Crippen and John Young. It too was delayed. Uh, everyone got the suspense, waiting for it to happen, and then it got scrubbed up fairly soon before the launch, a bit like what happened last time, only this time it was the weather. Weather, always something that we Brits talk about, so we're, we were quite happy. It gives us a second chance to uh, actually have, have a party and uh, celebrate the launch of, Dragon, of the Dragon launch. But the shuttle was a 36 orbital shakedown mission and eventually led to five orbiters being built and 30 years of missions. And the highlights included, and this is spot the decades that I, I grew up in, uh, highlights included the hub launch of the Hubble Space Telescope, the first docking of the Space Shuttle Atlantis with the so then Soviet space station Mir. Next slide. Um, so the space station Mir, and it was on this, this space station that we first got the, our experience of working in a, on a space station and working collaboratively with the Soviet Union and then eventually the, Russia. Um, but more, not many people realize this was actually the second time a US spacecraft had docked with the Soviet spacecraft in 1976. There was an Apollo Soyuz link up. So technically, me saying that it was nine years since the last Apollo mission 
is a bit is wrong technically, but it was nine years from the last lunar landing. And um, so the Hubble Space Telescope, I think, was what put the shuttle very much in the public forum. Uh, it was launched, everyone said, big deal, there's a big telescope going into space. And then when they got the first picture, it was blurry. I remember the newspaper headlines, Hubble trouble, and showing that uh, said, spent billions on this and we've got a blurry picture. The shuttle was the savior. We sent astronauts into space. This was a telescope that was designed to be repaired and worked on by astronauts. And by putting new instruments in, restored the site and revolutionized our understanding of the universe, the planets, and even took the, ver the picture of the furthest picture ever taken. Um, there have been several launches of the shuttle, several repair missions, and this is why the Hubble Space Telescope has now been operational for 30 years. Without that, it would have ended what, 20, 25 years ago, if, if not more. And then it was a, with a heavy heart that on the 135th mission on the 8th of July 2011, the space shuttle took its last launch into space. But it achieved a huge amount. Next slide. But because it, it there's the shuttle, one of its last missions was actually to repair the Hubble Space Telescope to extend it. Next slide. And without the shuttle, we would not have the International Space Station. It was big enough to lift the components, big enough to lift the heavy components. And without it, we would not have the International Space Station as we know it. And I would say this has led to a massive amount of inter international collaboration. July 2011 was the last launch of the shuttle. Next slide. And landed in July. And this was the last crewed mission from US soil unless you include Virgin's Unity brief launch into lower inches of space in December 2018. This ended the capability of sending US astronauts into space by NASA, but with a collaboration with the Russian Space Agency, we've been able to use the Soyuz spacecraft, next slide, the Soyuz spacecraft to send astronauts to this International Space Station. Now, I, I can appreciate the, the full excitement of having astronauts from your country with Tim Peake. There was a massive uh, drive in the UK about he was the first UK astronaut to go with the European Space Agency. Not the first Brit, but the first with the Space Agency. And as a result of that, I now in my planetarium shows get people almost knowing Tim Peake better than Neil Armstrong or even Buzz Aldrin whom I know was, came, came from, your, from New Jersey. I've done my research. Um, so the space station, we've heard a lot about it. And about 10 years ago, uh, the US government wanted open, opened up basic competition to get private enterprise to launch astronauts into space and you, on a commercial basis. So rather than NASA actually launching the spacecraft themselves, they contracted someone else to do it. And they chose two companies, uh, SpaceX and Boeing. Um, and the SpaceX, next slide. The SpaceX launch is the first of those. And it's also the first, it's an amazing program. It was a lot cheaper. They've done it basically in just under 10 years. So a similar time frame as the Apollo missions from the concept to actual starting it. And there's a nice cyclical thing about these particular, this particular demo launch. Um, launched from the same launch pad as Apollo 11 and the first and last space mission, uh, shuttle missions. And also it was is the shakedown mission just been so successful that I've just heard that NASA have said that they will plan to reuse 
this, the spacecraft rather than a brand new one every time that was, that was announced yesterday, I believe. Um, so this is, NASA have asked for eight missions um, open to other countries, the first time this has been done. Um, so NASA are basically subcontracting, buying a seat on, on, the, on the spacecraft. Um, it's also quite amazing because it's the first time most of so much can be reused. Uh, the actual capsule can be reused, the rocket can be reused doing the vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, the, I think probably the first time a vertical landing has been able to be done, uh, which reminds me of the children's program. I'm not sure if, it, if you've ever seen it called Button Moon, where they had the rocket coming down vertically. So my childhood dreams have been realized finally. Um, but there's another, um, and I've also heard that the return of the SpaceX is the, the Dragon current mission will probably be late July, early August, weather, weather dependent, of course, because it's landing in the sea. This is going to lead to potentially, the company is potentially going to lead to a uh, mission to the moon. Uh, they're talking from as early as 2023, who knows, and then eventually on to Mars. And I will confess, it's, it's an amazing visionary to be able to lead this project. And despite what people think about Elon Musk, he has achieved a phenomenal amount. Um, some of his other pro pro programs are, are causing a bit of controversy. Um, St Boeing Starliner, which is the other company that NASA is going to be using, will give up to the capability of seven astronauts or a mix to the space station and be used up to 10 times versus the Dragon can only be used about six times with a six month turnaround on each, each spacecraft. Um, and that's, that's probably going to be, we'll see the first demo missions of that later this year, passed a test uh, to date this week um, with its parachute system as well. Um, currently contracted for two test flights and six crewed missions, which will land on land, a bit like the, the, so the Russian Soyuz, not water. Personally, I prefer the water. It's probably a softer landing. Um, and next slide. So that was, so the Boeing, uh, and you probably noticed that they're all very similar to the Apollo capsules, um, all in vertical, all landing with parachutes. And in some ways, a vertical takeoff will be is safer because it protects that, that crucial heat shield, doesn't have the risk of bits of foam hitting it, knocking off tiles, etc. Um, and next slide, the future. It's not just into low Earth orbit. The future is to eventually send people back to the moon and to Mars. Since the early 70s, we've been seeing Mars in 30 years time. Early 80s, Mars in 30 years time. The 90s, 30 years time. Even this decade, beginning of this, at the end of last decade, uh, 30 years time, but having seen what SpaceX is doing the Boeing Starliner and the SLS program, which is, is moving forward. So they've had the European Space Agency uh, just contracted them to build the service module, which provides all the uh, oxygen support for the spacecraft. I reckon it's not gonna be 30 years, possibly maybe 20, if not sooner. Uh, so watch this space. Uh, but I, I would say this is probably one of the most incredible times to be uh, ex watching all these, these launches. But then someone who grew up in the 60s, 70s, probably saying they grew up during the most crucial bit with the Apollo and the shuttle. So who knows what, this, what these missions will inspire, whether it will inspire the next generation who will end up going to Mars. Great. Well, thank you, Colin. That was a nice uh, overview of the uh, of human spaceflight. Uh, I certainly remember the, the shuttle uh, launching. I remember watching that on TV and 
uh, back in 1981. Uh, and I do was fortunate enough to uh, see one of the last uh, shuttle launches, uh, which was, uh, I think, STS-35. Uh, that was one of the last, uh, that was the last uh, Hubble servicing mission that, that launched, uh, I think it was 2010. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were uh, very fortunate to be invited down to uh, NASA's uh, Kennedy Space Center for an educators conference. And uh, we really lucked out with the weather. There were no delays and the shuttle launched right on time. So we're very lucky and very fortunate to see that. It's pretty amazing uh, to watch a flight like that. And so uh, in the future, if any of you get a chance to uh, uh, go watch a launch, definitely take the time to do it because it's pretty incredible to watch something like that happen, you know? Uh, so- um, I'm not jealous in the least. <laughs> It was always one of those things I always wanted to see a, a rocket launch. I thought I can do it any time. And then they shut down the program. <laughs> to be fair, 30 years after it first started. So find me a car that's lasted 30 years. Yeah. So, done, yeah. It did pretty well, the shuttle. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely uh, got a lot out of that, uh, that program. And so, um, uh, so I guess we could... Uh, uh, open up uh, for any uh, questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions about uh, uh, space flight, uh, please feel free to, uh, if you're on Zoom with us, you can use the uh, uh, Q&A box there to uh, ask any questions there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you make a comment there and uh, we'll uh, uh, try to answer those questions as well. Uh, we do have a, a question here from Francis. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, how did the Soviets get near into space without the space shuttle? So the Soviets got near into space, but a bit in a similar way as the shuttle built the International Space Station in modules. And they used the, the rocket that they used to launch the Soyuz spacecraft, which his name has just gone out of my head. I think it was Vostok. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Vostok is one of these, it's, I, I know it. Um, and the word mir in Russian actually means peace. So mm. very appropriate for the first American Soviet link up, uh, which was still during the, the, during the, the, the Cold War. So it's, it was one st the start of the thawing out of relationships and the cementing of the working relationship we have now. So very much done in, done in modules because then you can lift little bits and build it up. Yeah, and also it's good to point out that the International Space Station, um, quite a few of the uh, core pieces were actually launched by the Russians uh, in the same way, uh, you know, and uh, uh, I forget off the top of my head about how many countries were uh, involved in the construction of the International, International Space Station, but it's quite a few. Mm -hmm. I think the Italians uh, built some you know, parts of it, the French, and now, of course, there's a Japanese module there. So the big international, the, 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 the uh, international part of the International Space Station was a really important part of it to make that whole thing come together and, and work. Okay, so, let's see. I think we've got a couple of more questions here. Uh, here's a question that uh, follows on some of the things that uh, Colin and you were talking about a moment ago. Uh, the question is, do you think humans will get to Mars in the next 20 years? Well, if, I, if I'm hedging my bets, I'll say what we've been saying for the past 40 years. In 30 years time, we'll get to Mars. Yeah. But I think with Visionaries like Elon Musk, we've got Boeing Starliner, we've got NASA's SLS program, and it's been announced they want to get astronauts to the, back to the moon as early as 2023, 2024. Um, I, believe, I believe your president has announced he's wanting astronauts back to the moon. So with that kind of drive, possibly within 20, 20 years, it's doable. And we've got several other robotic spacecraft going to Mars. There's the Perseverance being launched, I think it's this month. Yeah, in it's July. This month, yeah. um, which is going to try and answer some of those questions about water on Mars. And, and I get this question a lot in, in planetarium shows. Um, is there life on Mars? 
Possibly. Not little green men with two antenna. No idea why they've got green antenna today. Um, not little green men or people like us. It will be probably bacteria or microbes because they can survive the extreme conditions and it won't be, and you won't find it on the surface, probably about two meters down through because of the radiation from the sun. Right. right. Um, but someone's also just, just seeing someone asking, what can you do in space? Um, and I guess this is another question. Why do we send people into space? Why, what can we do in space that we can't on the earth? And some of the benefits of going to space is, sadly, it's bone loss. This is some of the research they do is the effects microenvironment gravity has on the human body. Um, you have a rapid decrease in bone strength. And they're using this research for looking at bone thing disease like osteoporosis, developing ways to reduce the effects of that, um, grow better crystals. Um, and also there's the whole earth monitoring, being able to monitor the earth from space and actually when a natural disaster does occur, uh, flooding, um, earthquakes, etc., they can actually use the data from space to actually get the resources where they're needed. Um, but also the long-term effects on, on the human body. Because if we were to go to the moon, if we were to go to Mars, it's going to be at least a year to get to Mars. Six months to a year on the surface, another year coming back. And that's a huge length of time without, gravi without the weighting yeah. of gravity. I won't say without gravity because there is gravity. Yeah. But the effect, we don't feel that effect on the body. So muscle loss, bone loss. So studying this, we can work out how to minimize the impacts of that. Yeah, and it's, it's difficult to you know, be that long in space. So that, that's a, a big challenge. I think uh, some people may not realize that it's not necessarily just the technical challenges of building a spacecraft and going to Mars. It's the impact on your astronauts that's perhaps the biggest hurdle I would think I would think. I guess one of the people people often say well why not just send robotic spacecraft into space whether it be to the moon to Mars instead of sending astronauts well robots can only tell us so much and yes we can get an overall view we we'll probably get more information from the spacecraft that have gone to the moon than what the astronauts have in the grand scheme of things, but astronauts, robots can't pick up a rock to look underneath it. Um, they can only see what's in front of them, an astronaut can look around them. So they can see a wider picture and using the experience, they can say, oh, what's that over there? And pick it up. If you're going to Mars, you've also got time delays, up to 20 minutes before you can get a radio signal there. So you spot something, takes 20 minutes for you to know that it spotted something. It takes another 20 minutes for you to tell it to go nearer it. So that, that reduces how much uh, science you can actually get out of it. Um, and, there's, and things like human effects, drugs, things like that. So there's, there's lots of benefits. And yes, there is a cost to that. It's expensive to send astronauts into space. Um, for example, um, the cost of sending an astronaut into space on the, on the space shuttle was about $170 million per astronaut. And that's much less with the, the, the private one with, with Dragon, Crew Dragon, it's about 60 to 67 million. So massive decrease in costs. Uh, but some would say the benefits outweigh the, 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 the benefit we get from that. Is, is money well spent. Okay. Uh, here's a uh, follow-up question uh, from Francis. Uh, when astronauts go back to the moon, what new knowledge or discoveries are they hoping to gain or make that they didn't already make before? In other words, why go back to the moon? And yeah, I've heard that attitude before from some people saying, well, we've been there, we did that, why are we going back, you know? Why are we going back? It's a very good question. And as I say, it will cost. But by going to the moon, uh, we can, we've only been to what, six, 
six spots. Six, six places. Um, yeah, six spots. So it's very much pinpoint bits. Uh, we brought back 50 kilograms of rock, mm. if that. Um, so by going back, we'll be able to explore it more. Um, we've got a bit greater understanding of the moon, having had those robotic spacecraft in orbit. Um, we've even had a spacecraft on the far side of the moon land on it. Um, but also, if we go to the moon, we could set up bases. Um, seems we're being asked, I think I know who, who said that. Yeah, David actually. asked about what, what you thought about moon bases. That was yes, the I think question. that's actually one of my colleagues. Um, by having lunar bases, we can be on the moon, we can explore it more, but we can also use it as a stepping stone to other places, to asteroids, to Mars. Because the bulk of the cost is actually getting people off the Earth's surface. Because the Earth is big enough that it has this pesky thing called gravity, and it keeps us on the ground. And it takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort to get you off that. If you're on the moon, it's much smaller, much less gravity, so it's a lot cheaper and you use less fuel to get from, from the moon. So moon bases is possibly the way to go. Some argue, just, let's just go straight to Mars, but possibly using the moon as a stepping stone, it will give us more experience about that long distance travel. We also have a question, uh, how soon before we can safely have trips into space for leisure? So yeah, oh, space tourism is kind of a- That's a, a great question topic. because, yeah. because actually it's beginning to happen and it has already happened. I uh, yep. used to be able to buy a, a seat on the uh, Soyuz spacecraft and just spend a week on the International Space Station of the year. Uh, so you used to be able to do that. It was costly. Um, yeah. The Crew Dragon, that's another possibility if you're able to do that. If you have a spare $60 million, it's becoming affordable. Um, Virgin Galactic, they're planning to be able to send astronauts into space for that tourism, not going to orbit and coming back. Um, they've, they've been doing some testing this, this week, um, yeah. not this week, this, this month. Um, I think they did a test last last week, last month. Yeah, they did some kind of a, a glide test, you mm. know, in the Virgin Galactic, uh, was it Spaceship Two is what they call it. Spaceship and, Two, yes, we don't talk about Spaceship One. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, and Virgin Unity, they, they did a very close uh, flight in 2018. So it is something that's possible. And I'm not sure I personally want to go into space. Uh, one, I'm afraid of heights, which is quite a fundamental <laughs> thing. Um, yeah. But it's, you've got, from everyone that's said it, it's find it, some people find it very disorientating having this vastness in front of them, just effectively floating and losing that sense of up and down. Um, even on the International Space Station, there, there is no up or down in space, but they have got certain things printed on the walls to, to give that extra frame of reference to help uh, change that. But space is, space is harsh. Uh, you've got to have your a protective environment around you. So your, space sh your, your spaceship, whatever form that is, your space station, it's got to have lots of layers of protection because there's lots of micrometeorites, bits of rock, there's lots of debris, there's something like a half a million pieces of debris in space orbiting the Earth, um, the size of a marble, if not bigger. Um, and the astronauts do report hearing the tinkle of, this, of these rocks and debris actually hitting, hitting the walls of the space station. Um, there's lots of satellites up there. What happens to those satellites when they stop working? They mostly sit there, some burn up, some just sit there. We've got 40,000 objects. So you've got to track them. You've got to keep your eye out for them. Try not to drop anything. Tools, mirrors, as uh, one of the astronauts, I think, uh, was it Bob Benkin or Doug Carley? One of, the, one of the, the current crew on the Dragon mission uh, managed to drop a mirror, um, which they used to see behind them because the spacesuit is, they can only see a little amount they can't see behind them. 
So they use mirrors to give them a wider reference point. And so it's, it's harsh, very harsh vacuum, uh, very hot in the sun. You go into sh their shadow, it goes down to minus, what, minus 100 degrees centigrade, plus 200 odd. So the spacesuits themselves have to have protection and cooling and, and heaters so that you can maintain that plus, plus of the atmosphere. So the worst thing you can do is puncture your spacesuit if you're in space. So it's harsh. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. So a difficult environment to uh, operate in. And that's something that the astronauts have to train for. Uh, certainly the uh, NASA astronauts do a lot of training uh, underwater uh, because that kind of simulates the buoyancy that you, you have. Uh, they go into a big tank, a big swing, swimming pool, basically, and uh, the buoyancy simulates some of the weightlessness that you uh, get in space. And uh, they really have to get used to doing everything wearing a big set of gloves, you know, they're, and they've they got this big spacesuit that's a little, you know, a little stiff and it's got a bunch of layers to it and it's inflated and so it is kind of stiff. And so they have to uh, work twice as hard, you know, just uh, undoing a bolt or, you know, using a wrench seems like simple enough, but when you're in a spacesuit, it's twice as hard as doing it here on Earth. And so it also, takes a while for them to do that training and, and get used to that sort of thing, you know. So. And also use, using tools in space, because you don't have that gravity, you don't have the friction, you right. turn a spanner wrench, you end up, it has, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Right. You turn the <laughs> wrench one way, you go the other way. <laughs> and if you yeah. push off, you don't just, move away and stay there, you mm. float to the other side of your spacecraft. Right. <laughs> so you've got to be tethered at all times, otherwise you just fly into space and become the next bit of space debris. Mm. I'm not sure that's a nice thing thought. But is there still, seeing there's another question, is there still yep. competition between the US and Russia or is it more cooperative? Very much a piece of collaboration. Yep. Uh, without that collaboration, we would not have the space station as we know it today. Um, yeah. And it would never have been built. And it's not just between the US and Russia, there's the whole of Europe, um, the Japanese Space Agency, Canada, Space Agency, Can um, one of the, I think the space station probably came into its full awareness of it with astronauts like Ma Massimo, who was huge in social media. Um, we had, Chris Hatfield from Canada, he really promoted it. And I think with his David Bowie uh, video from, from the space station, that, that's what put the space station on the map and got everyone talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Tim Peake did a huge amount in, of course, in Europe. I have to fly the, the British flag here. Um, <laughs> but it, it got all the schools involved in the UK. And as I said earlier, people are talking, I say, who was the first person on the moon? Some, the first name that comes out is not Neil Armstrong or Buzz Aldrin, it's Tim Peake sometimes, <laughs> which gives that opening gambit to allow us to actually talk about the space station, the work he did, but also the historical flights such as the Apollo missions, without which we, we probably wouldn't be where we are just now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, um, looking a little bit further in the future, I mean, you did mention, uh, I believe mentioned that um, the current uh, Dragon crew is scheduled to come back to Earth at some point soon, probably the end of July, beginning of August, something like that, depending on the weather, as you mentioned. Uh, so I guess a couple of people have been asked me, well, when's the next launch happening? And I believe they're talking about late August, early September, uh, it's going to be the first kind of operational launch of Dragon. And I believe there'll be four astronauts on board, I believe, at that point. And uh, though the Dragon the spacecraft is capable of carrying more, I think it's, uh, if you don't, if you're not carrying any car cargo, I seem to think the, I think they can carry up to six, if I remember correctly. Uh, but for most of these NASA missions, they will be carrying cargo. And so four astronauts will be launching uh, at some point uh, towards the end of the summer. And so that's something to uh, look forward to. Yeah, and we've also got the first Boeing Starliner is lined right. up. I think they'll be doing a, a robotic uncrewed mission right. 
probably the summer, late summer, and then the first demo crude mission will probably see end of the year, beginning of next year. Right. And both those spacecraft are reusable. And, and I think also, actually, this whole reusability, that was something that the Apollo missions weren't able to do, but the shuttle was. That was one of its prime goals, was to reuse right. it. But the, the shuttle boosters could, were reusable as well. And I only discovered this, a really neat fact, that the nose cone of one of the boosters from the first launch of the shuttle flew on the last launch, which yeah. is a, a nice little bit of... Cyclical um, <laughs> history. Yeah. It just tickled me when I found that one out. But talk, talking about space, these launches do make life very easy for those of us who work in planetaria because we don't have to try and encourage people to get involved, talk about it. People come to us and say, Tell me more. And this is something that we found in the planetaria around Britain that. Tim Peak, there was a huge drive. We all got together. Um, there was a planetarium show was created collaboratively around Britain through through the British Association of Planetary, BAT for short. And that's there's probably no time to think. Um, there's probably about fifth, probably about oh seven or eight fixed domes, six fixed planetaria in the UK. Uh, including England, Wales, England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. And also there's many uh, mobile planetaries, so inflatable planetary, which go into schools, uh, which isn't happening at the moment. So, uh, but planetary haven't gone away. We'll still have a presence and we'll still be able to talk about the night sky. Um, simulate the night sky, not just the night sky, but also take you, simulate those rocket launches and show you the spacecraft that are going to Mars, going to the moon, going to asteroids, show you positions of the Voyager spacecraft, which launched in the seven, late 70s, are now the furthest spacecraft from, from the Earth. So, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating topic, fascinating job to be in. I think Kevin, you probably agree that it's, it's that enthusiasm, passing on that enthusiasm uh, is what really makes it for us. Yeah, yeah. We, we really miss our audiences. I think uh, everyone who works in planetariums are really missing our audiences and all those nice questions and, and that sort of thing. So uh, it's always, always fun. So um, Let's see, uh, I don't see any more questions here. Do we have any more questions from our Zoom audience or uh, on uh, Facebook? I didn't see any questions on, on Facebook recently in the past few minutes. Uh, so our last call for, for questions here. Um, keep in mind that uh, Ask the Astronomer will continue through this summer. Uh, we will have uh, two pro two additional programs, one in July, uh, mid towards around mid July, and then towards the end of August. Uh, we're also going to try to put together a little stargazing program for you, a little summer stargazing. Uh, we'll talk about the, the nighttime sky and uh, hopefully take a look at uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And I think we're planning that for early August. And so uh, definitely check out uh, our website. We're going to be posting some of our summer programs soon. Uh, here we have a question um, uh, from our Zoom audience here. Are, are there aliens on Earth now? Where are they? <laughs> oh, where are they? It's a very good question. Um, are there aliens on Earth? Not that we know of. <laughs> right. and, and the thing we have to also bear in mind, if we're looking at life elsewhere, um, we're, looking at, we're looking at with the view of life as we understand it, water-based life. There could be some form of life out there that doesn't require water, and therefore we would, the experiments we use won't pick it up. Um, but there are a few contenders in the solar system, apart from the Earth. Um, places with water, off the top of my head, would be Mars, moons of Jupiter, Europa mm -hmm. has lots of yep. water. Um, some of the moons of Saturn, because remember, the rings of Saturn are bits of lumps of ice rock, mostly ice, uh, ranging from the size of your hand to the size of 
a large car or a small room. So there's a couple of the few of the places in our, our solar system. The spacecraft going to Mars, ex European ExoMars, uh, NASA's Perseverance, they're looking for evidence of water, looking for evidence of mi microbial life. Um, ExoMars will drill down two meters below the surface, as I said earlier. Um, because, because Mars is a much thinner atmosphere, the radiation from the sun can penetrate through the rock. It's much stronger and can get through rock down to about two meters. So that's when we start looking um, under the permafrost. And so those, that's, that's some of the things we're looking out for. Um, and even if there isn't life, I, I reckon there'd be an awful waste of space if there weren't life somewhere out there. Bear in mind, the first planet around another star was only discovered in 1996. Right. Since then, we've discovered, it goes up every day. I think we're up about 5,000 now. Yeah, almost there, yeah, yeah. If not more, and that number goes up every time. So yeah. we went up and from knowing of the eight, nine planets at the time, now eight, quite rightly. Not a controversial whatsoever. Um, Pluto being a dwarf planet, um, so we've gone from eight or nine planets, few asteroids, to 5,000 stars with planets around them. So, and it's shortly with the Webb telescope, which will succeed the Hubble Space Telescope, we might be able to actually image the atmospheres of those planets directly. And that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. So we're really looking forward to Webb being launched, which will probably still be late 2021. Yeah. Being delayed a little more, but it will be worth it when it comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the Perseverance is the next Mars rover that NASA is launching. And that will, I believe, is scheduled for July 22nd. They delayed it for a few days, but uh, I think it's on, on schedule now for July 22nd for a, a launch. And that will land in February of 2021. Uh, so early next year. And uh, yeah, it does have uh, quite a few instruments on board to look for organic molecules and things like that. And so it's going to be an interesting mission. The previous missions focused more on geology. This one is a little bit focused more on, on life and the possibility of finding life or even past life, evidence of past life on Mars as well. And um, one of the interesting uh, experiments that's on board that's related to the topic we're talking about today, uh, if I remember correctly, the instrument is called MOXIE. And uh, it's uh, really cool because it's gonna, it's an experimental um, device uh, that will, will suck in carbon dioxide. That's what the atmosphere of Mars is made of, very thin carbon dioxide uh, atmosphere. And as you, many of you probably know, uh, carbon dioxide, what is it made of? It, it's CO2. So you've got oxygen there locked up in the carbon dioxide. So the job of the MOXIE instrument is to break up those, that, that carbon dioxide and make oxygen. And so that would be really important for if that works, works out, uh, it could be a really important uh, thing to have for future uh, missions on the surface of Mars. And following on from that, going to Mars, um, looking at ways of growing plants as well. Um, I think we've most of us have seen the Martian um, where they use the plants. Um, but the plants, that's some of the research they're also doing on the space station on how to grow plants and the wavelengths of light the plants need, which have actually led to being able to grow plants better on the earth um, use, using lights uh, rather than the sun in places like places where, um, like during the winter above the Arctic Circle, and where there is no sunlight, they have to use artificial lights to grow plants. So by using the research they're doing in the space station, they're able to grow those plants better. So you, you can get tomatoes in December. Um, but going to Mars, yeah, we said in 2020, what, 30 years ago? Yeah. 20 years ago, we said 2020, 2030. I reckon, well, I, I reckon, as I said earlier, I think possibly 20 years would be a realistic number. Um, but I'll go out there and say, yes, in 30 years time, we'll be on Mars. <laughs> 
you know, another uh, 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 aspect of uh, the effects of, uh, of space on the human body we uh, didn't really mention, uh, Edward is asking about uh, with the effects, without the effects of gravity, do you actually grow a bit taller after being in space? Yes, because in space, you don't have the gravity pulling down on all your bones. So your bones actually slightly, um, not quite detached, but the gaps between them increase. And so astronauts will grow about an inch, two inches uh, on this, uh, during a mission, which is why when they return to Earth, um, they have a lot of them suffer massive back pain because suddenly that's, your spine has been compressed, you've got gravity, and also if you've been in space for a long time, uh, you've lost a lot of the um, strength of your muscles. If you don't use your muscles, you, don't, you lose the strength in them. And I read something point I was told somewhere, it's you lose something like 5% of muscle strength every month you're in space. Mm -hmm. So it, the longest mission was Scott, Ke for a US astronaut, I think it was Scott Kelly. Right. And he was just on, just over the year, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. And he, he had massive, huge amount huge pain when he returned and goes through a very intensive physiotherapy program to build up those muscles and reduce that joint pain. And yeah. anyone, all these films which show people going to Mars, getting out the spacecraft and just jumping out, forget it. No. After a year in space, you're not going to be able to jump. You might be able to step off and go, ah, but uh, you're not going to be jumping around. So it's going to take a while if you go to Mars to actually build up that muscle tone again, to be able to actually do, to do that exploration. Yeah, and the, the Kelly brothers are from New Jersey. Uh, so if you want to learn more about the differences between uh, uh, the, that showed up between the two, the two brothers, you know, one stayed on here on Earth and the other was in space. And so if you'd like to learn more about that, check out the, uh, the twin project that the NASA did. Uh, we have uh, one last question uh, here. Let's uh, uh, another uh, question from Francis. Uh, how do planets in our solar system spin at different speeds and what explains those differences? Yes, well, this is actually a question that we're still asking. Everything spins in space. Um, we have some planets that even spin the opposite direction from all the others, Venus, for instance. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we don't really know. And most of it's probably because it started off, actually, a lot of the reason, some of the reasons is because, to explain this, I need to take you back five, it's not, 30 years, 40 years, I want to take you back 5 billion years, as you do. Um, because 5 billion years, there was a big cloud of dust and gas. And this dust and gas started clumping together. As it clumped together, it had more mass, it had a greater gravity pull, it started attracting more and more dust and gas, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. The gravity of this started squeezing down as it squeezed, it got hotter, and eventually it got so big, the pressure was so high in the center that nuclear reaction started. The sun, sun was born. But there's still lots of dust and gas going around this. It's all spinning. And it clumps together, it spins around. And so it's probably mostly conservation of all this energy moving around, and it just keeps going round and round. And everything, as I say, spins in space. But uh, some of the planets do spin the opposite direction. Venus spins what we see upside down relative to all the other planets. I think the tilt's 178 degrees off axis. And yeah. um, the planet Uranus is spins on its side. It's about 93 degrees off axis. So the season on, on Uranus will last 30, 40 years. Imagine winter, 40 year old, 40 year winter, 40 year spring, 40 year fall. So yeah, so why does it speak, why, and why do they roll like this? We think possibly in collisions. Uh, shortly after the planets were formed, large rocks, asteroids, crash into these planets, knocking them over. But even now, planets still hit by, are hit by rock. Uh, 40,000 tons of rock hits the earth 
every year. And we try and keep an eye out for these things because they can have quite serious effects. To the 1907, today, there was a large asteroid came in over, over Russia, over Siberia, and flattened half a forest. Um, Guska. Guska, yes. Today, which is why today is International Asteroid Day. Yep. Um, there was an event, a Chelyabinsk event in over Russia. Uh, oh, I want to say a few years ago, but it's probably more than I want to think, um, where it was a 17 meter piece of rock that broke up. And most of actually the injuries caused by that wasn't so much from the, from the rock itself, an impact, it was actually from the pressure wave. Traveling faster than the speed of light, the pressure wave that actually knocked out all the glass of glass buildings, smashed windows. It was also very bright because it heated up. So if you imagine rubbing your hands so fast that they melt, that's effectively what's happening with the rock, it's rubbing against the air particles. And so people looked at this, it was actually brighter than the sun and suffered eye damage from that, which is why you should never look at the sun or anything bright. Your, your eyes are very sensitive. Um, and so we keep an eye out for these asteroids, but we can see the rocks hitting the earth. We can see them. I go outside, especially mid-August, I'm sure Kevin, you'll be talking about this in your future programs. Yep. Uh, we have the Persei meteor shower. It's one, it's one of my favorite, largely because it's warm. Um, astronomy is one of these hobbies where it's not a warm hobby. You've got to go out in the depths of night when it's cold. Um, but the Perseum meteor shower is warm and you can see anything up to 20, 30 meteors an hour shooting stars. Middle of November as well, the Leonids. Um, but not all of these shooting stars are rocks. Yep. Some are space debris, some are defunct satellites, and some are things from the space station because we try and recycle everything. We try and recycle all our food, all our packaging, all our water, every last drop of it. But there are certain things you do not wish to recycle. So they package them up, chuck it out of the space station, and it burns up in the atmosphere. And so if you've ever made a wish and it hasn't come true, it might be because you were making a wish on some astronaut poo. <laughs> Well, on that, that note, let's uh, wrap up. We're, we're uh, a good way to, to end our topic of human spaceflight. Uh, and so uh, we're out of time. And so thanks for joining us today, uh, Colin. And thank you to everyone who's uh, joined us online. Uh, please do come back and visit us uh, again for some of our upcoming programs. And uh, so thanks for being with us. Take care, everyone. Have a good, week. Have good, have a good holiday weekend, everyone.